welcome to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate, where we discuss e-commerce issues and whether our guest today automated, delegated, or eliminated them and why. Your host is Will Christensen, co-founder of Data Automation. And again, welcome to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate. Welcome to the Automate, Delegate, Eliminate podcast by Data Automation. I'm your host, Will Christensen. I have Nathan Hirsch here on the line. And Nathan is the, I'm still calling you the founder of FreeUp, even though he doesn't own the company anymore. He recently sold FreeUp and is now into a new venture with a company he's calling Outsource School, which is super powerful stuff. I've been pretty impressed with what I've seen there. We're already an affiliate and a partner of theirs. And so this is going to be a little bit of a different episode. We are actually going to focus today on transitioning and maintaining a remote team. So, you know, we interrupt your normal podcast, automate, delegate, eliminate piece where we would normally pick apart a process and then have Nathan defend some sort of process that he had either automated, delegated, or eliminated. We'll get him on another show to do that. But today we're going to talk about transitioning and maintaining a remote team. So welcome, Nathan, and we appreciate having you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yep. We're excited. So really with the world today and you know COVID-19 and some of the things that are there, this episode is about helping those business leaders and the employees of those businesses who have been affected by this and forced to go remote. And we know that going remote has been quite difficult. I have a brother who works at a company that does a lot of bill collection and things like that. He works on their development team and they have never allowed remote work before. It's always been very tight knit very strict as far as what they'll allow that way. And now at least his division is completely remote. And so he'll be one that I'll be sending this podcast to, to be like, hey, look, this is what you're probably facing and and what you'll continue to face. So he was messaging me the other day about office chairs. (laughs) What office chair should I buy? Yeah, I just gonna say, and I think even before COVID-19, the whole world was going more and more remote anyway. I think this is just going to speed up the process a little bit. And I mean, you're right, it it is different. And I actually kind of had the opposite. I opened up an office with my Amazon business. And I did that for a year or two, hated it. I felt like I created a nine to five job for myself. And I lost the freedom and the flexibility that I had worked so hard to build. And I felt like bringing people to one place actually added drama that I didn't have to put up with when it was remote. And I also added overhead to a business didn't really need it. It was a drop shipping business. So I quickly got rid of it. And I've been doing the remote thing for ever since. And really one of the reasons that I opened up the office was I was going a little crazy working remote. I mean, I was young, I was tough. It was really tough to schedule my time. It was really tough to manage people. There was that loneliness factor where it was just me in an apartment alone and pacing around. And so I, I think there were a lot of reasons that made me get an office. And then when I realized that that was a bad business decision, and went back to remote, I did a lot of self reflection and said, okay, I need to change my working environment, my working habits it's how I communicate with people. And now I'm remote and I'm loving it and I wouldn't change anything going forward. Yeah, I agree. So I originally throughout my career, I worked in an office, worked in an office, worked in an office, worked in an office. And it was funny because I would go to my wife and I'd be like, look, when we move, I will not drive more than 10 minutes like my commute. And so like when we bought a house and we bought it because it was literally less than 10 minutes from my office, because the idea of commuting, you know, and I know some people waste up to two hours a day getting in and out of an office and I just couldn't handle that. And so I've always had that kind of efficiency drive. That's part of why I started the automation was because I just, I can't stand some of that. So I did a lot of office work. And then even at the tech incubator where data automation was founded, we founded in an office. And about a year and a half ago, I had the opportunity to go remote and I went remote. We had a a couple of other people who were remote and slowly the entire team started to go that direction to the point now where we have some office space in Athens, Georgia. I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. I've got a project manager in Chicago and another one in Tennessee. So we're our entire team is remote right now. And so just in the past year and a half, we've had the experience of going from an office and me leading an office that was everybody in there at the same time to remote. So that's the goal today is is just to discuss some of the challenges that we face, what you did, Nathan, what I did to lead a team and recognize what's there. So Nathan, let me start out with what would you say is the number one challenge that companies are either facing right now because they've gone remote or going to face 
most companies have have already had to go remote at this point. Yeah, and I'll kind of break it into two parts, and it kind of go they both go together. It's boundaries and communication. And I've been talking to my neighbors from six feet apart, <laughs> and I've been just talking about like what they're going through and their managers and their bosses. It seems like that line's been blurred about when they can be contacted when you're in the office and you can go home. Your boss isn't usually calling you on your cell phone when you're working remote. The the manager or the boss feels like they can contact you at any given time. And I mean, someone like me who's been working remote spends a good amount of time setting those boundaries of, hey, you shouldn't be vibing me at eight o'clock at night over something small that I can just can wait till the morning or vice versa that, hey, VAs aren't going to work for me if I'm reaching out to them and bothering them on the weekend on something that can just wait until Monday. So I, I think there's that part of it is establishing what those boundaries are up front and, and respecting the people that you work with enough to hold to those boundaries. And then the second is communication, which you need to spend time sitting down with your team, whether they're a US team, Philippines team, whatever, and say, hey, these are the communication channels we're going to use now. And here's how we're going to use each channel because you don't want messages coming in on your phone, on your, via email, via Skype, via Slack, all over the place. There needs to be a certain set of orders. So for example, and people can copy this or they can come up with their own communication channels. We use email, Slack, and WhatsApp or Viber. WhatsApp or Viber are basically the same tool, um, but it, just a free texting app. And we used to use Skype, now we use Slack. And emails are response within a business day. So if I send you an email, I expect a response. I expect you to confirm that you got an email or that you did whatever the email was for. And I expect you to clear your inbox whenever you come on next. So if I send someone an email at 9 p.m. and their shift is at 9 a.m., I expect them to respond to their emails when they first get on that next morning. So I lay out, this is how we use emails. And if it's something urgent that you need a response right away, you're not sending an email. If something happens on the weekend and you're my weekend manager and something's blown up, you're not gonna shoot me an email because I might not check that email until the next business day on Monday. Next is Slack. That's for day-to-day -day communication. When you're working for me or with me, you are on Slack. You're communicating on Slack. You say when you start work, you say when you end work, you put in when you go to take a break, when you come back for break. And when you're working, you give updates. That's where you ask questions. That's where we have meetings. I'm a big proponent of doing meetings via Slack. So everything's in writing and nothing gets misinterpreted. I work with a lot of people that are outside the US. So there's a culture and a, and a language barrier as well. And then WhatsApp and Viber are for emergencies. They should have them on their phone. And yeah, if, so if I need someone at night, let's say I'm locked out of something, I need the password or I'm working my developer and the software crashes on the Saturday, you should have Viber on your phone. And yeah, you might not be able to respond to it instantly because you have a life, you're with your family or whatever, but within a reasonable amount of time, that's how I should be able to get a hold of you. I shouldn't send you a Viber on a Saturday and get a message back from Viber that you don't have a Viber account anymore. That's something that we set from the beginning that if you're going to work with me, you have to have Viber on your phone at all times. So three different communication channels used in different ways. And just like I wouldn't Viber someone for something that was easy, I wouldn't send them an email on something that was urgent. Absolutely. I mean, honestly, Nathan, as I was brainstorming around some of the ideas or things that I wanted to share with people, the second thing on my list is, uh, you know, create a standard operating procedure for urgent items slash communication. And we do the same thing. So client communication, it has a lot of external features to it. And we set expectations with the internal team, but also externally, like, hey, if you email me, don't expect immediate response. Like I tell I tell clients that like you, you cannot expect me to immediately respond and clients then have that same concern. Well, if I can't get you over email, you know, how can I get you? And so there are some clients that I'll, I'll give them a WhatsApp or I'll give them a cell phone number to shoot me a text message. I establish those same boundaries with clients as well as the internal team. And obviously in this situation, you've already been remote with your clients because in a lot of situations, you're not in your client's office. So the same sort of rules apply. So, you know, we do the same thing. And, and, and one other layer that we've added to it is if like the entire world, like a server has gone down or something that really does have to be addressed in the next 15 minutes, we've established the SOP that we actually make a phone call on a cell phone. So like in the middle of this podcast, if I were to see my phone open up and on my phone, it's my developer calling, I would have to pause the podcast and answer that call. That's how urgent it is when he calls me. It's funny because like I look at my phone and when my phone rings and it's somebody who's on my team, I know that I have to stop everything to go look at that because something like literally something is on fire. And we have other methods of communication that are like the 
this isn't a full blown fire, but it needs to be addressed in the next hour or two kind of thing. So totally agree with you. Yeah. And there's a certain sense of resetting those boundaries. I think you and I both have had clients who don't honor those boundaries, who have reached out to us at random times that stuff that was not appropriate. And, and that's why it's important to, yes, establish it up front, but hold people those boundaries. And, and I'm never one to, to be rude or unnecessarily like mean to someone. But there's a time where you're just like, hey, listen, like next time you contact me, this is my calendar link. You can book a time with me or shoot me a text message and I'll call you back. It's stuff like that. So depending on how your business is run, everyone's a little bit different, but hold people to those boundaries. And whether it's internal or external, if they're not honoring them, pause it, take a step back, reset the boundaries. And only on when you're on the same page, do you continue with the relationship? Honestly, it is super important to recognize that it's okay to reset those boundaries. Like you just said, right? You know, you'd be, you might be surprised how often a client will actually respect you more if you're willing to put your foot down and recognize that. And that's the same thing with with employees or with 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 employers, right? If your employer is calling you in the middle of the night and you've just started this remote thing and you don't give him the feedback, the like, hey, it's really annoying when you call my cell phone and I'm sitting down, I'm watching a movie with my wife. You don't understand after the sixth or seventh or tenth time that that happens, the wife turns over to the husband or the husband turns to the wife, whoever's gotten interrupted, but like, hey, maybe you should be looking for a different job. Your boss doesn't seem to be respecting your boundaries. Like it's it's amazing how much those communication boundaries can affect the overall morale of the team and setting proper expectations make a huge difference. So let's shift a little bit here. You mentioned something that I thought was very valuable. You talked about how, hey, Slack, when you're on Slack, when you're working with me, when you're working for me, you're on Slack. Like that's that's the way that you're you're essentially clocking in. Like if you're in the office, you're on Slack. I also tell people not only are you on Slack, but you're at your desk. And, and I and I don't care if you've gone to your friend's house and you've got your laptop up. It's important to me that you have a work set up where you can be consistent and things are moving. So if you have a second monitor, take it with you to your friend's house. That's fine. But be as productive as you can and be responsible about what you're what you're getting done. What expectations have you set with employees to help them recognize? how to be completely present, even though they're not having to physically transition from one place to another. Yeah. And for me, it's all about a quiet working environment. I mean, that's what we care about. And it's all about being productive. I mean, I, I've had people that can sit on the couch with their laptop and if they're crushing it, I don't really care. But I mean, if I'm if there's people in the background and we're having a phone call or stuff like that, and it, there's clearly a distraction, that, that's what gets me. <laughs> I mean, my fiance is downstairs working on a desk that we have downstairs. And it, I guess her company policy is they, they can come in and check on you. And I don't think they're going to come with the Corona. But for people that are working from home, they have the right to like check on your space at any given time during work hours. So they kind of have that right. So I mean, it is something that a lot of companies take seriously than others. I think it kind of goes on the spectrum of are you more corporate? Are you more startup? But for me, it is important, like fireworking environment. One thing that's big in the Philippines with virtual assistants is, hey, you can't be watching like three of your kids and working at the same time. Like you have to have someone, whether it's a husband, a wife, a family member, a babysitter, whatever it is, that, that's handling your family, your distractions so that you're 100% focused on work. And, and that's something that just from my experience in the Philippines is a good thing to lay out to, for, to them right from the beginning. Yep, Nathan, you might be psychic here. That actually is like the third bullet point that I wrote down, like watching kids <laughs> while you work. It's kind of interesting because we didn't pre-plan this, right? We just basically said like, hey, what are some of the challenges? And it's cool that, you know, as you look at things, these are common things you're going to see across the world. So every once in a while, I'll have a situation where my wife is, she's inside the house. I'm out here in the outdoor garage office. So establishing a space where you work so you can actually transition. So you do have some physical transition. I mean, working out of your bed, like if you want to pop up your laptop and do that, that's fine. But I've found for me physically, it's healthy to separate that. Well, she'll bring my daughter out and sometimes she'll play on an iPad in the background. And so I can keep an eye on her without getting in the middle of everything. And so I think it's important for me, that's okay. And I've set the expectation with my team, that's okay. But I think it's important that you set those expectations and you recognize where it is. And I set those expectations and those boundaries with my wife as well. She knows that if I send her an all caps text message, like, please come get, you know, please come get the kid. She's no longer okay with the iPad. It's time to come and help there. And when I'm on a podcast, I lock the door to my office and they know, oh, he's probably on a podcast because that's the only time I lock my door. And so we talked about setting expectations with employees or with your employer. We talked about setting them with the clients. You also need to set expectations and boundaries with the others who share your workspace, which would be, you know, your family members, or your partners or whoever's there with you, roommates, that kind of thing. So super important that all of those boundaries are set and know that it takes time. How 
how long would you say, Nathan, that it takes before you can kind of get into a rhythm if someone's had to move their space or they've recently gotten married or they're trying to like transition and be like, oh, now I'm remote. How long before they really start to get into the rhythm? <laughs> it took uh, Quinn and I about a week. We originally gave her my office and I would just come in and kick her out whenever I had a podcast. And that didn't work very well because I, I do a lot of podcasts. So I was just kicking her out constantly. And then we set her up with her own working environment. And then we kind of realized that there needs to be a certain amount of communication too, so that um, if I'm if I'm on a podcast, she's making sure the dogs aren't coming upstairs. If she's on a phone call, I'm not going downstairs yelling on the phone or whatever. I guess I don't yell, but just talking loudly on the phone, I'm going downstairs. So I think there's a certain element when you're working with other people of what are your outside commitments, whether it's the, the kids, the dogs, whatever. How are you going to communicate? What parts of the room are you in? And then how do you actually get away from it when work is done? Because the last thing you want to do is feel like, oh my God, it's five o'clock, but I, I can't get away from anywhere, which I feel we all, we all kind of feel a little bit trapped right now. And that's why, I mean, I work out, I take a break and I work out every single morning. At the end of the day, I, I'm going through and walking my dogs and getting away from my office, shutting my office door and not going in there until the next day and kind of having separate parts of your house to separate that that work life. Yeah, it, the idea of creating a space for yourself, even if it's, let, let's say that you're in a studio apartment and you really don't have a separate room that you go to, even if you just, you know, hit up the thrift store, pick up a desk, sanitize it down, sit down and you have a space that is like this is my workspace and then you you move to another space to build that so we've talked about a lot of boundaries today we've talked about you know boundaries for employers for employees for clients your personal boundaries for the other individuals who are sharing that space and then there's also boundaries you need to set with yourself and so I, I totally appreciate how you broke that up right there's two different things that need to happen here and one is boundaries and those boundaries are so so important okay so Nate I know you are an expert extrovert. And if you're not an extrovert, you're one of the best actors I've ever met. So I'm curious, <laughs> if, I'm curious about that. But how do you handle being alone all day? I, yeah, I actually consider myself a natural introvert. I mean, only because I don't necessarily gain energy from being around a lot of people by the time I'm done with it. And I can do it, I think, decently well, but I'm not gaining energy. I usually need to rest and regroup by myself um, at some point. And that's kind of how I define introvert and extrovert, where someone can just keep building off energy of other people. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it took me a while. I think dogs help. That's my biggest, quickest tip is I have two dogs and it's fun. I can take phone calls while I go for walks and get out of the house. I think the other thing that's good about my my business is I have a business partner that I that I really like working with that I get to throw ideas back and forth and he works remote I work remote I actually really like having my fiance home here now so it's not just me home alone but when it was just me I mean it's about structure and routine I mean I figure out what are the times of the day that I'm the most productive I'm most productive between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. so for the first two hours it's, it's me just cranking out projects then and I'm talking non coronavirus I would take a break I'd go to the gym at nine o'clock so two hours alone hour of the gym working out with other people a gym's right down on the street and then I would come back and then I would go on podcasts and I would be talking with other people for the next few hours or doing webinars or whatever it is. And then by the time that's done, I'm wrapping up the day with maybe an end project or talking to my team or whatever it is. So and inside of those are, are different walks with dogs or try maybe I'll go to the grocery store, stuff like that. So I kind of try to structure my day. So it's never just me working by myself, not talking to anyone for eight hours, but it does take some getting used to. And, and I also know it's not for everyone. I mean, my sister was has been working at a nonprofit for the past six months months and it's her first remote job and, and she hates it. She can't wait to leave it and get a new job and at least have flexible where she can work from home some days and in the office some days. So it, it's not for everyone. And if you don't have a routine, you're, you're going to go crazy. Yeah, totally hear you there. I, it, it's interesting. I, I define extrovert introvert the same way. And I totally read you wrong there. That's interesting that I would have guessed that you gained energy from people because I, I've seen how energetic you are on stage. And so I'm I'm impressed. That's, that's an amazing talent you've put there. I, on the other hand, I'm an extreme extrovert where I totally gain energy from people. And my wife has been teaching me the ways of an introvert over the past uh, several years to the point where like, I am okay with being alone sometimes and getting some of that down. And so for me, we've been seeing the memes on Facebook and social media. Like, you know, if you have any extrovert friends, stop, put the book down, call them up, they are not okay. With all of this, right? So I mean, it, it is true, this being at home thing can be quite difficult. But what I've found that and you may not know this, a video call where you are face to face or a phone call like this one, where you're interacting with another individual can actually help you draw some of that same energy. I'm amazed at the level of conversations this transitions us a little bit. I'm amazed at the level of conversations that I can have with my team with my wife, 
life with anybody. And obviously my wife's here, but you'd be amazed at the level of intimacy. And I don't mean in an inappropriate way, but the level of watching someone's face, working with people. There's an individual on the free up team. His name's Marius and he runs the accounting. Marius and I are good buddies. I've never met the guy in person, but we did several phone calls where we we chatted and, and I, I learned more about what he was doing and he was going to get married. When he jumped back on after he'd gotten married, I was like, dude, how was that? What, like, are you're married now? And he's like, I know it's so weird. There is a level of social intimacy and, and interaction that can totally fulfill that need as an extrovert. So for all you extroverts out there, if, if you you're really hating the idea of not, you know, being all alone, open up a Zoom call, open up a Hangout, open up whatever and work alongside somebody like open it up, just leave it open. I do that with my assistant right now. She's in Atlanta. I'm here in Salt Lake City. We'll open up and we'll just work together. We're not even working on the same thing. But but if she's got a quick question or whatever, we'll create that space. We don't do that all the time because it can be somewhat inefficient at times, but we'll create that co-working environment, even though we're not in the same room. Yeah, I completely agree. I actually counter that a little bit. And this is a personal preference. It has nothing to do with there's no right or wrong here, but only because I do a lot of podcasts and I find myself like on Zoom pretty consistently. Whenever I don't have to be on Zoom, whenever I don't have to be face to face, to me, I don't want to be out. I'll, I'll ra I'd rather put my headphones in, be on my phone and go walk the dogs and get outside and get a little bit of exercise while I talk and walk and same type of thing. You can still have great conversations, but I don't do a ton of face to face with anyone on my team with, with Connor, unless it's, it's a very rare situation only because I or else I would just be on zoom face to face eight hours a day, you know, and see, that's the cool thing here, Nathan, is, is you have a way of remote working and you've adapted to that. And so do I. And for me, I am on zoom face to face with my team for several hours a day. And that actually helps me feel more energized because I'm I'm more of that extrovert, right? So I, I just think it's powerful that, that there are there is technology, it's, it's out there, there are amazing pieces uh, uh, of what's what's going on. So I want to shift the conversation a little bit towards how do you handle some of the more difficult conversations or situations that happen at work? And I mean, think about, you know, having to fire someone or having to have that conversation where you're like, hey, performance is not where it needs to be. Let's get it. Or having the conversation with a client where the client fires you and you think about, wow, I do not, I can't even imagine having that conversation where I'm not in the same room as that other individual. What would you share with someone who brought a concern like that to you, Nathan? Yeah, and it's a lot of what we teach in our course at the end of, of cracking the VA code, where, where how you fire someone and the right way to do it. And keep in mind, I'm only talking about virtual assistants here. If I was like breaking up with my fiance, if I was breaking up with my business partner, hopefully neither of those things happen, but I would handle this a lot different. So speak, strictly speaking, VAs in, in the Philippines, I really just send a message. Before I do that, I get into the mentality in my head that, hey, I'm going to be direct. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be professional. And no matter what direction this conversation goes, I'm just going to stick to my points and I try to be, I don't get into somewhat specific, but pretty vague. I'm going to be the bigger man, the bigger woman. I'm going to be professional. I'm going to do everything possible to protect my business ahead of time. So that's removing access and everything before we have the conversation. And I'm going to be direct like, hey, Kim, I'm sorry, but we made the decision to let you go. You haven't gotten this task the way that we wanted you to. It's nothing personal. We wish you the best of luck. If I can help you in any way in the future, let me know. Come direct to the point. I'll send it via Viber, via WhatsApp. I won't send it via Slack or Skype because I've removed them from those channels. And that, that's really how I handle it. And I mean, they're, they're only going to handle it in one of a few different ways. They're going to say, hey, I understand best of luck and leave, which most people do. They're going to have some follow up questions, in which case I stay professional without giving too much information and let them know the decision is final. Because a lot of times they'll say, oh, is there anything I can do? Stuff like that. And then the third way, if they start acting irrational and crazy and all of that, I mean, that kind of just reinforces your point that they probably weren't a good fit for your business. And you just have to be professional. And if it gets to it, you block them. You can try to find creative solutions like seven pay and stuff like that if you really want to. But my recommendation is you stick with the facts, you're direct, you're clear, the decision's final, and you're the professional person and you're moving on. I totally hear you. I, I have had to let a virtual assistant go. And that was exactly what I did. I, I didn't do it face to face. I actually think I chose not to do that because I wanted to allow that virtual assistant that privacy to be able to, you know, hear my voice and, and talk about it. I would have done it face to face had she wanted to. Obviously, I don't think she knew ahead of time that's what we were doing. But I chose 
chose not to turn on the camera because if she chose to get emotional or, or, or did get emotional, I wanted her to have that ability without having to, to look at that in a, in a strange way. And it was a tough conversation to have. I, I wasn't thrilled about having to, to have that, but it went fine. She handled it just fine. And we, we took the proper procedures to remove access appropriately and got everything where we needed it to, to be. And honestly, before that conversation, I had many conversations with this individual and I've had many conversations with others about performance. And I'm amazed that if you establish a habit of how you're communicating with people and you do it in a respectful way, it doesn't matter whether or not that's in person or over the phone. Now, obviously, there are situations like breaking up with a girlfriend or other things like that where you're, you definitely want to be in person. But I'm amazed at how much you really can take emotion wise, intention wise, you really can communicate quite well over a remote channel enough so that running a business and having some of those tough conversations is totally possible. Nate, any other feedback that you'd want to give someone if they were saying, you know, hey, I've got this tough conversation I'm going to have to have with a client, would you recommend that they turn on video for a tough conversation? Do you recommend they don't turn on video? Would you recommend doing that over Viber, WhatsApp, Slack, Skype? How do you recommend having those sorts of conversations? What technologies would you say? Yeah, if, on the client side, I almost do always do a phone call. I, if someone's really upset or I need to end something or I, there were a handful of clients that I had to click, kick off the free up platform over the past four years, I would almost never do it via email unless it was something, maybe if I was just terminating them, I might send them a professional email and say they can't use free up. But if it was something that I was trying to actually solve or, or something that, that I think could escalate further, phone call is really my go-to. I'm decently confident in my ability on the phone to just communicate clearly and get my point across. Sometimes email is not as effective or sometimes people interpret email differently. I would never do a video, but that's more of my style. I mean, with free up, we didn't really give clients access to video calls. So why would we do that at the end? It doesn't really make a ton of sense. So I think a lot of it just depends on, on what your relationship is with the clients, how you've been doing it. For me, I really just kept it to phone call and email. So if something did escalate, it was which one do I choose? And for me, most of the time, I felt more comfortable personally with phone call. Okay, awesome. Really appreciate that. I want to kind of move the conversation here a, a little towards tools. We've talked a lot about communication tools. So I don't know that we need to go too deep into, into those. But let's talk file sharing. What tools have you used? What systems or boundaries did you put in place to make file sharing easy when you were working with the remote team? Yeah, I honestly keep it very basic. I, I use Google Docs. We use Dropbox. We're using Vimeo for videos right now because we're filming a course. So just stuff like that. I mean, you don't have to go too crazy. You can add LastPass and different elements there. You can give certain people access to view things and other people access to edit them. I remember you asking me back in the day when you first met Marius, you're like, so you just give him access to like all your credit cards and your bank accounts and stuff like that. And uh, I mean, the answer is usually yes. I I'm someone who likes to build a lot of trust with people over time. And there's also only so much people can do. I mean, what are they going to do? Steal my credit card? I'll file a chargeback. I'll get the money back. I'll fire them. I'll move on. And for me, yes, there, there are certain things like I, if I hired a bookkeeper, like I just hired a bookkeeper now actually for outsource school. Um, it's actually Morris's wife, which is kind of cool. Um, but <laughs> she's awesome. Yeah. And, and so I, I'm giving her like view only access just because it's, it's a lot different than free up. She's not like sending money and paying people and accepting payments. So uh, you, there's different creative ways you can do it in every bank and every credit card system. And, and with other files, you can give people different admin access and stuff like that. And again, the average virtual assistant cares a lot more about building a relationship with you and working with you long term and keeping you as a client or staying on the free up platform than they do about stealing or jeopardizing your information. So you should definitely use things like LastPass and you can make people sign NDAs, but are you really going to chase someone across the Philippines over a piece of paper? Probably <laughs> probably not. I mean, you, at some point you have to build trust with people and, and give people access over time within reason. Yeah, I would echo that. The level of access that you are retaining, like if you've got a boss, he's got like a list of passwords written on a piece of paper and he wants you to come get that piece of paper. Obviously, if he's remote, you can't come get that piece of paper anymore. You're not as, it's not as successful. That boss is, has got to recognize that one, paper is a little outdated in, in terms of storing passwords, but two, there are systems in place like LastPass and Google Drive and other pieces that you can easily give people access to the information they need. And, and I want to echo what you said about relationships. In terms of security, the most important thing you can do is build a relationship with the individuals you're working with. That individual that I mentioned that I had to let go, we still have a relationship. And I told her like, hey, hit me up. Let me know if you need any help finding another position. I'm happy to refer you and tell people about you know what some of your strengths are because because there are a lot of those and there just wasn't a, fit, a right fit for the right time. So building that relationship with those individuals is going to help protect you from a lot of the negative sides that come from that. So let, let's 
let's talk remote meetings. What tools do you usually recommend? Do you just recommend a phone call, Nate? Or what, what, where do you go with that way for remote meetings? No. So I actually never do phone calls with my virtual teams. Um, I keep everything on Slack. Everyone's writing everything out. Everything's in text. If someone can miss a, if someone misses a meeting, they can go back and read it. It keeps things from being misinterpreted. I don't know if you've ever tried to have a Zoom call with 10 people in the Philippines before. It never goes as planned. Internet cuts in, internet cuts out. People miss important things. Not the best way to go about it. Unless you want people to have to like go back and watch your meetings over again. These are people that actually attended the meeting, which isn't a great use of their time either. I recommend keeping everything in Slack. Now, it's a lot different. Quinn downstairs meeting with her team that's all in the US that is used to office face-to-face. -face. They're doing everything via phone, everything via video chat. That makes a lot of sense. I'm working with VAs in the Philippines. So there's a culture difference. There's a language difference. And I found that just keeping everything on Slack makes it very quick and efficient. So tell me about that. When you have a meeting that you're wanting to have over a chat conversation like that, are you putting that on the calendar? And then in the location field, you put in like a Slack hashtag for a specific channel. Like this is where the meeting is going to happen. And it's inside a channel on Slack. Like how does that work? Yeah, definitely. So I'm setting this up with Outsource School now. So with Free Up, every meeting was at 10 a.m. with all the VAs. And then every single team would have a separate meeting throughout the week, one meeting per team per week. So the accounting team met every Tuesday. Day. Uh, I think success team was on Wednesday, whatever it is. So we're just building our team with outsource school. And I actually sent out a message yesterday saying, Hey, this is what we did at free up. We had meetings at 10 a.m. Does, does that work for everyone? We're going to start this up in, in the next week. And we also have some part time people, some full time people. So I set the expectation that, Hey, if you're part time, you don't have to attend the 10 a.m. If you're not scheduled to work at 10 a.m., you don't have to attend the 10 a.m., but you are expected to next time you're on, read through the meetings, ask questions, acknowledge that you read it before you keep working. So eventually, hopefully, we build up a 35 person team on outsource school like we did with free up and we have full-time people and we have lots of people attending the meetings but for now it's hey like i have a, a leader for my video editors i expect him to be at the meeting the part-time video editor who's on call for work doesn't have to attend but he can read it later so i set that expectation i made sure that that time worked for everyone because if everyone said no that doesn't work it needs to be at 9 a.m or 11 a.m i don't really care i'll just make it at whatever time works for everyone and and that's what we're setting up going forward so yeah that's exactly how we do it i'll honestly i love love doing these podcasts because I find that a lot of times I actually discover something where I wasn't handling it that way or it's a little different than I had anticipated. And that's honestly something very different than what I was thinking. So I mean, that's cool. Like I'm, I'm actually I'm going to write down chat meetings because that's not a way that I've done it before. But I could totally see like I've had engaged, you know, chat meetings before where everyone is engaged and they're, they're looking at it. And most of the time, it's because there was a crisis. And it just doesn't make sense to be on the phone. It makes more sense to be in a chat. But I can see how, you know, if you have a dedicated time where, and I've done a few of those where I, I'm meeting with a developer who's overseas and he's not comfortable with English over the phone. And so he's preferred chat and it's worked just fine. I'm curious about this idea of like a team meeting over essentially texting. So super interesting concept there, not one that I had played with much before. Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny. Every time I, I talk to clients, they're like, oh, how should I do meetings? And I'm like, do it via Slack, do it via text. And then they're like, oh, that's crazy. I don't want to have to write everything out. And then they try to do like group meetings via voice or group meetings via Zoom, and they just never worked out. And actually, when we sold free up to the Hoth, the first thing the Hoth tried to do, and, and they they weren't like rebelling against us, they just didn't know. They they tried to do Zoom meetings every single week, and it was actually one of the things that we just forgot to mention, only because we just been knowledge dumping every possible thing to them. And so I was like, oh, by the way, like you don't want to do that. Like let me show you like how you actually want to do it. It's going to be a lot better if you do it this way. And, and they were to, to their credit really quick to just end it and, and go back to the Slack, and they realized how much more efficient that that was. So it's definitely something I've seen work for VAs in the Philippines. Cool. Well, I'm definitely going to try it out. We're going to play with the idea of possibly doing like a team meeting, a team wide meeting. We've got uh, one customer service person who's on the, you know, from FreeUp who is in the Philippines and, and she does great on the phone. So it hasn't been an issue to, we did a team wide meeting yesterday and it, it worked just fine. But I like this idea of playing with that because the idea of not having to record it and send it to somebody, that's pretty powerful. So last piece of the conversation here or last two pieces of the conversation, I want to talk again, a few more tools. What tools did you use more specifically around project management to kind of keep track of tasks for the team? I know there are, you know, obviously a lot of a lot of stuff out there, Asana, Trello, ClickUp, many others. What did you use to try to keep track of tasks? 
we use Trello and I like to divide it up between day-to-day -day operations, short-term projects and long-term projects. That's another thing when you're dealing with remote teams, you kind of don't know what everyone's busyness level is. And you're going to have certain days that are really busy, certain days where it dies down and you're not really like, you can't go to someone's desk and see they don't have any work. So with me, it's, I load them up with, Hey, here are short-term projects, here are long-term projects. You do do your day-to-day -day operations. If I add anything in, you do those. And then you start working on the project. So they always have that backup. They always know what to do during their downtime. And, and I found that very effective. And then the other thing um, that I, we use for developers is Jira, which I'm sure you're familiar with. That was more on, on Connor's side. So I, I didn't have a ton of experience, but I, I know that the de developers strongly prefer that over a Trello. Awesome. Yeah. And we use Trello. Our developers have been okay with Trello. It's been good enough for what they're wanting to do. And, and they've had other concerns about And Jira obviously has some integrations with GitHub and, and other systems that way that are pretty powerful. But we use Trello for our internal project management. And then, uh, you know, we've tested things like monday.com and several other pieces. Recently, I've been messing around with ClickUp, which is actually a pretty powerful tool if you haven't had a chance to look at it. Like their whole game is like, we do everything, which usually isn't good for software. Like usually, Usually I find like if you specialize in Kanban boards like Trello, you're going to be better at that. But I've noticed that, you know, as I've been playing with ClickUp, I've, I've been impressed with their Kanban functionality. And then they have another functionality that's kind of like Slack. And so it's, it's kind of a runner up that I, I hadn't seen before that I've been pretty impressed with some of the things that come through there. Okay, well, last thing I would say is when you're communicating, did you do anything with screen recording where you were like, instead of uh, sending me a screenshot and then, you know, texting it all out, did you ever have situations where you're like, no, show me what the problem is and, and record screens. Have you tried any of that, Nate? Yeah, so we did use Loom and we still use it. I mean, Nate McAllister, myself and Connor who are working on outsource school, we send Loom videos all back and forth all the time. We're actually building a really cool SOP software that's gonna essentially think of it like Loom, but it's gonna, and you're actually, this is the first person I'm explaining, or uh, first publicly I'm explaining how it's gonna work, but it's gonna let you go step by step. So when you finish step one, you click step one, step two, you click, and at the end of it, it organizes your videos by steps. You can re replace it so you don't have to redo videos or do any video editing. You can add text. So you can label the steps and put documents in there. It's going to be a library of SOPs that you can give certain VAs access to and remove those access to. And it's going to be make it a lot easier for you to just record a task, send it to a VA. And just like you said, if the VA messes up or the VA wants to fix something, you'll be able to, to create a video and send it back very easily. Or the VA will be able to go in and update the SOP and create the video so you don't have to do it. So we're excited for that as well. But we definitely use those quick recordings to, to share information quickly. Nate, when you get to the point where you're looking for some beta users who are going to be like free for life because they've added so much value, you let me know because uh, I will hook you up there. That's actually, I've had the idea that somebody needs to create a Loom or Loom Screencastify. I just got a recommendation from a friend of mine called Vidyard, which is another one like this. And obviously Nate's new tool that's that's going to be coming out. Hook me up, Nate. I'm, I'm interested in helping do that because I create SOP videos for assistants, for project managers, for different individuals in my company all the time. And I'd be very interested in testing that out. Sounds good. I'll definitely keep you posted. Well, we really appreciate you joining us today. I want to end here asking Nate just a couple of questions. Nate, if you had parting words for people who have had to go remote, what would they be? And then at the end here, I'd love it if you'd share any other piece of wisdom that you wanted to share with the audience that, you know, these e-commerce sellers and other people interested in automation. Yeah, I guess my last tip is just don't put all your eggs in one basket. A lot of people, you make some bad remote hires and you finally find someone you like like and just keep giving them more tasks, keep giving them more tasks. And you can't tell when they're getting overwhelmed or you can't tell when your entire business just relies on that one person and you don't realize how risky it really makes your business. So make sure you diversify as you hire. So I'm one of the easiest entrepreneurs to contact online. You can reach me on Facebook or LinkedIn, Nathan Hirsch. You can reach me on Instagram or Twitter, the real Nate Hirsch. And feel free to connect with me. I love networking with other entrepreneurs. You can also go to outsourceschool.com and follow our journey and we can help you use virtual assistance going forward. Awesome. Really appreciate that. Appreciate you being here. I appreciate everyone joining the Automate, Delegate, Eliminate podcast as we went a little bit uh, away from our normal programming to give you an inside look to transitioning and maintaining a remote team. Thanks, everybody. You've been listening to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate, hosted by Paul Christensen.